Brother Itzhak just been blessing the little ones today. <laughs> they're, they're so excited. Praise the Lord. Shabbat Shalom. So we're going to finish up our tour portion on our second part. It's, it's going to be a little bit shorter. And my wife already gave me the eye. Uh, not the stink eye, but the uh, observant eye. So uh, we're, we're going to go to uh, Shemot Exodus chapter 8 real quick. And we're going to finish up this portion. Uh, this uh, part of the portion is dealing with Pharaoh and uh Moshe is going and he's making a stand for the people of Israel. We see this over and over in Scripture. Those that are uh, held in a, in a place of authority with Messiah Yeshua, they're going to make a stand for those that can't. Uh, one thing you'll see this in Moshe. You'll see this in, uh, we're going to be reading in Purim about Esther, uh, Hadassah. And so she's going to have to make a stand. And so you'll see the disciples. The disciples have to make a stand uh, as they're going forth and witnessing. Because they said they're going to cast you out of the synagogues. And they're going to bring you before rulers. They're going to beat you. They're going to do all these things uh, to you. That has to do with making a stand. This is what it means to partake of the cup of Messiah Yeshua. To partake of the cup, this is connected to it means that we're willing to be a witness for him in whatever capacity and, and however he wants us to do it, so to speak. So this is what Moshe is doing. Again, this is a connection to the end time. This is the return of Messiah. Uh, these are the things that you're going to see happen. They're going to manifest on the earth. Uh, you're going to see plagues. You're going to see all these things that are mentioned in Scripture. But you hold fast to your confession. You hold fast to you, you be sure Messiah because uh, whenever you see all these things take place, and I was trying to study this, maybe somebody has something to add to this. But when I studied this, it's about how long all these things took place. Uh, you have difference of opinions in the Mishnah. It says right about a year. The rabbi says about a year's time, all these things took place. And some say, some others say with a few months is when all these things took place. But, but you see, it's a very short time. So it, uh, what I see is a season, uh, again, in biblical year, if you're looking at what Yahweh is talking about in a year, he's talking about from uh, connecting to the harvest, spring harvest, to the finished harvest of uh, Sukkot. So what did Yeshua say? They said, tell us when this will be. He says, the, in English, it says, the end is the harvest. Uh, if you look, look it up, and I don't like to Greek everybody out, but uh, in the Greek, uh, that word uh, is teleos, telos. And so it means, it's where we get the word telescope. So the, what he's saying there, the focus is the harvest. They're wanting to look at a calendar date. He said, you're asking the wrong questions. <laughs> he said, the focus is the harvest. So everything is going to be connected to a message about harvest. What is the harvest? About food? No, it's about people. And so that's why the feasts, uh, is there a gathering of people? There, you see at Passover, there's a gathering of the barley, gathering of the people. You see the Shavuot, gathering of the wheat. It's the gathering of the people. You see it, the fruit harvest, the gathering of the fruit. This is all the, the fine fruits, is everything. And you'll see the gathering at Sukkot. You see that it's all about the harvest. So the, the feasts and the Shabbats are a vehicle to bring in the harvest. So when we come together, this is, this is what he asks us to do. And so... That's why it says some, when he talks about the harvest, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Uh, he's saying it's not about as much as uh, you're comparing yourself with somebody else. It's about are you doing, are you working the harvest? Are you doing what he asks you to do? That's all he's asking. And so it's not up to us. To, to do the count. Remember David, he counted. Did he get in trouble? <laughs> yeah. So it, it has to do with just doing, simply doing his will. So in chapter 8 uh, of Shemot, verse 1, Exodus 8, verse 1, Yahweh says to Moshe, Say to Aaron, reach out your hand and your staff over the rivers, canals, and ponds, and cause frogs to come up out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt. Aaron put his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs, frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same with their secret arts and brought up frogs onto the land of Egypt. Again, you'll see they're really not that bright. 
<laughs> it, Yahweh's bringing it, uh, this, these plagues. In other words, these frogs are just swarming everything. And so they're, uh, when you see a, a frog shows up, you know, some of them die and they, they start getting rotten and flies are kind of all these things connected to them. So you're seeing all these things take place that's bad to them. And, then, and instead of getting them away, they want to copy it. So you, you kind of see how uh, a, a message as far as when Yahweh asked to do, asked us to do things. Just read this in Joshua. There was a time when he said, I, I need you to go to battle. And they're like, man, we don't want to. And they're like, you need to go now. And they're like, no, we don't want to. And then later on, they're like, yeah, well, I guess we'll go now. He's like, no, the Lord said not now. That was earlier. He's like, well, we want to do it now. Well, you can't go. We're going. And so they said, well, if you go, you're, you're going, they're going to wipe you out. Because Yahweh's not behind you. He's not telling you to do it now. Well, we want to do it now. So they go and they just get whipped. <laughs> they get embarrassed. And they get running back to the little short uh, group of uh, opposition came and just whipped them and embarrassed them and sent them back running. They couldn't do anything. He said, why? Because Yahweh didn't tell you to go. He, to he told you when and where. You're trying to tell him when and where. It doesn't work that way. So he's teaching them uh, what, what it means to be obedient. O obedient. What, what is the, the whole duty of man? but to fear God and keep his commandments. <laughs> Simple message all the way through Scripture. Uh, that's what Adam and Eve did before the fall. As long as they were doing that, there was no fall. There, there, was, there was no curse. There was, uh, they didn't have to have a house. They didn't have to have heat and air. They didn't have to go pay for their water. They didn't have to pay for food. It was all given to them. Everything was already given to them. And so the, the, this is what Yahweh's always been trying to give us. He's always been bringing, trying to bring us back that. And it will come back to that. It will come back to his original design. That's the promise that he gives us. And so verse 4, uh, four says, then, then Pharaoh summoned Moshe and Aaron and said, Intercede with uh, Yahweh to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice what it says. Uh, but it has to do with uh, entering into a relationship with him. This is basically what he's saying here when it talks about uh, sacrifice. And sometimes in the English, uh, it's translated sacrifice, and the Hebrew word is sometimes it's korban, korban. Uh, it means to draw near. It's Hebrew to draw near. It's, did he say if you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you? Uh, that's the word Corbin. So if you know anybody named Corbin, uh, that, that is a, a Hebrew word. It means to draw near. And so this is where uh, verse 5, Moses said to Pharaoh, not only that, but you can have the honor of naming the time when I will pray for you, your servants and your people, to be rid of the frogs, both yourselves and your homes. And then that they stay only in the river. And so what he's saying here is, okay, just to make sure you know it's not some kind of trick from our hand. And he said, I'm going to let you pick the time when the frogs are going to leave. Just so you'll know, you know, you can, you can pick a number. <laughs> pick a number, and that's when they'll leave. So he let him know that uh, it's not just some random thing. And so he answered tomorrow again. How smart is that? You're being overrun. Okay, tomorrow. What about right now? <laughs> and so you'll see the stubbornness of the mindset. This is how the world operates even today. You'll see this stubbornness. That's why in Revelation it says they'll pray for the mountains to cover them. What they're saying there is they're going to pray for the frogs. They're praying for these gods, these demonic uh, spirits to act on their behalf. They're going to pray for Buddha. They're going to ask for Muhammad to come and help them. They're going to, they're going to ask for Krishna or whatever. You know, whatever it is, uh, this is what they're going to do. And, and it's nothing new. They did this even in biblical times. Because Yahweh says, uh, you know, these gods that they're worshiping, he says in the prophets, he said, when uh, the enemy comes, let, don't ask me, let them pray to their gods. He says, I've kind of had enough of them. <laughs> I've shown, I've helped them. I've, I've moved for them. I've given them the best of the best. And they still want to chase after our other gods. All right. The enemy is going to come in. Ask your God to help you. Ask the Christmas tree to help you. Ask the Easter bunny to help you. Ask the tooth fairy to help you. You know, ask the elf on the shelf or whatever. But, and, and this is where uh, he's, he's telling him, 
to, so that he will know. He said, tomorrow, Moses said, it will be as you have said. And from this, you will learn that Yahweh Elohim has no equal. The frogs will leave you in your homes, and your servants and your people. And they will stay on in the river only. So uh, this had to have been out of sequence. In other words, again, in Egypt, in the Nile, during the time of the frogs, when they would come out, hey, here he is, Yeshua. And so when the frogs would come out, this is when they would have a fertility uh, right. In other words, it's the frogs would all come out and start laying their eggs during, during the high season of the Nile. And it would be around August. And that was the goddess we talked about, uh, Heset. Uh, Heset, I think is what her name is. And so this is where uh, Yahweh is showing them it's not Heset that's in charge. He says, I'm in charge. And this is what he's trying to bring across uh, to them. It's going down to uh, 16 or 12, rather. Uh, chapter 8, verse 12 of Exodus, Shemot. Yahweh said to Moshe, say to Aaron, reach out with your staff and strike the dust on the ground. It will become lice throughout all the land of Mitzrayim. They did it. Aaron reached out his hand and his staff and struck the dust on the ground. And there were lice on the people and animals. All the dust on the ground became lice throughout the whole land of Egypt. The magicians tried their secret arts to produce lice, but they could not. And so now he's putting the limit on them. Now he's saying, you know, you got away with it for a little while, but now I'm going to show you, you can't do what I do. In other words, I'm cutting you off. I allowed you to do that before, but now it's not going to happen. And so, uh, again, he's almost having mercy. He's like, good Lord, they're actually wanting more to produce more lice now. <laughs> the, all the dust just turned to lice. Now they're wanting to do it again. Like, okay, sit down and shut up. <laughs> you know, what are you doing? And so it says they couldn't. And, and so uh, this is where uh, this becomes personal. There, there are some things, not only did it affect, you know, before they could stay away from the, the blood, they could stay away from the water. Now everything's coming to them. And so you'll see these levels of judgment that's coming. That, this is what you're going to see before the end time. You're going to see levels of judgment come upon the land. But if you're a follower of Messiah Yeshua and you're trusting in him, these things will not come against you. He says this all throughout the scripture. He says this through the bread Hadashah. You know, these things will not come near your dwelling. You have to understand Goshen. Goshen was a place Yahweh had them to be. When, when, they, when they stayed there, this is where he protected them. All the plagues did not, the darkness did not come. The plagues did not come. The angel of death did not come. Now, that this was the different when we get to the angel, the past, actual Passover, because he told them, you must apply the blood. And this is also for the Jew. And this is also for the Israelite. They must apply the blood also. Because if they do not, apply the blood now it's 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 going past observation it's it's now you're, you're coming into a place where you're going to have to participate you're, you're going to have to participate it doesn't matter you know there, there's favor 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 now you're going to have to make a commitment now it's going to be personal to you oh praise the lord i saw the light <laughs> once was in darkness uh and so it says, the magicians tried, verse 15, the magicians, magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God, of Elohim. But Pharaoh was made hard-hearted, so he didn't listen to them, just as Yahweh had said would happen. So Yahweh knew this was going to happen. Yahweh knows every issue that's going to happen. He knows this in the end time. He knows what every kingdom's going to do. They're going to rise up against Yahweh. He said every nation's going to turn against Israel. And I'm sorry, it, it breaks people's hearts, but Every nation, every group will turn against uh, Israel. Uh, just the other day, uh, I think uh, when their, Israel was basically defending themselves, with, Brother Itzhak would know more about it. The first thing Israel does when they defend themselves, everybody condemns Israel. Like, what for? <laughs> so you, you'll see that our gov our the president of the United States, <laughs> They first thing they did was send an official condemnation of the actions of Israel because they defended themselves. Like, really? Come on. And so, come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> but whenever he, uh, when he does this, it, it's a glimpse of the mindset 
of this, it's replacement theology is what it is. And, and you'll see they don't want to submit to the actual word of Yahweh. They want their own version. They want to bring their own version. They want to do things on their own time. And so let's go on down to, uh, uh, he talks about the, the swarm. Let's go to uh, verse, uh, chapter 8 and uh, verse 16. Yahweh said to Moshe, get up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh when he goes out to the water and say to him, here is what Yahweh says, let my people go so that they can worship me. Now, why is he going out to the water? Remember, Pharaoh's daughter went out to the water. Pharaoh keeps going out to the water. What's he doing? Uh, th this has to do with part of that worship. Uh, one, one thing, the Nile was worshipped as a god, and Pharaoh had his... Uh, mindset and what he was trying to get the people to think was that he's the God of this river. He, he's the God of that. We'll read that in a little bit in, in Ezekiel. And this is why you'll see that those carvings. If you ever looked at e seen Egyptian hieroglyphs, there's this one guy, he's standing up there and he's got a crocodile head on him. <laughs> that, this is where uh, Moshe is a uh, an Egyptian word that means drawn from. So there, there was more than one Moshe. Not, I'm not saying deliverer. What I'm saying that people who had that name in Egypt, there was more than just Moshe the deliverer, the Levite. There was different Egyptians named Moshe. There's Tut Moses. Tut Moses is the first, second, third, whatever. And so it means they he was drawn from the water. So in other words, when Pharaoh's daughter drew him from the river and called him Moshe. She's trying to attach an Egyptian title to him. So this makes him legitimate in her house. And it's, when we read this earlier for when he was born, his mother looked upon him because when is, when is a Hebrew child a name, by the way? Anybody remember? On the eighth day, uh, on the day of his circumcision, that's when he receives his name. So he was already circumcised, so he already had a name. But this is what the Egyptian uh, daughter, because she's trying to justify him. Now, some of the rabbis say that, uh, some of the oral tradition says that uh, Pharaoh's daughter, I don't, again, I don't know, this is just tradition, said that she actually was, was wanting to be immersed when she went out. They said she wanted to be immersed to become a follower like the Is Israelis. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's part of the oral tradition. Uh, maybe she was being dealt with. I don't know. But whenever it says, uh, let's go to 17. It says, otherwise, if you won't let my people go, I will send swarms uh, uh, of insects on you, your servants and your people into your houses. The house of Mitzrayim will be full of swarms of insects and likewise the ground they stand on. But I will set, this is what I want to get to, but I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people live. No swarms of insects will be there so that you can realize that I am Adonai, I am Yahweh, right here in the land. Yes, I will distinguish between my people and your people. And this sign will happen by tomorrow. Yahweh did it. Terrible swarms of insects went into Pharaoh's palace and into the servants' houses. The insects ruined the entire land of Mitzrayim. In other words, the swarms of locusts just came, or a different bug. It can be different ones. But little, they came and they devoured everything. But, but over in Goshen, everybody's just sitting back drinking tea, <laughs> eating their challah bread, <laughs> and worshiping the Lord, enjoying the, the, the water, probably swimming. And off in the distance, you hear screaming and, and all kinds of roar and chaos going on. But it was not going on in Goshen. And so this is what it means to be in Messiah, in the Lord. You don't have to fear judgment. Matter of fact, this is what it means to be a witness. You, you actually look forward, uh, and, and it's kind of a dichotomy. It's kind of a two-edged sword. You look forward for the coming of Messiah. At the same time, you're ready to do a work until he comes. Uh, and this is what it means to be a believer. We're not trying to get out of here because you, you sure you have to remember he gets everything he asked for from the Father. You know what he asked for? Father, I pray that you don't take them out. <laughs> now, there's some men's traditions and men's uh, a doctrine that say differently, but Yeshua is going to get what he asked for. He says, Father, I pray that you don't take them out, but you keep them from the evil one. 
Keep them from what that which is evil. In other words, he's going to have a remnant here. And, and that's why there's, you're not going to read about 12,000 from every denomination of Christianity. There's going to be 12,000 from every tribe of Israel. So when you're a believer, you're an Israeli. You're, this, you're a part of that covenant promise of connected, being connected to the land. You have an pl a place in the kingdom and in the land for the return of Messiah. So uh, this is why you'll see uh, these promises in Revelation. Revelation is very connected to the Exodus, by the way. It's very, when you understand, if you study the Exodus, you study Revelation, you're going to see the connections. You're going to see the times. And you're actually going to know when these things happen. <laughs> there are these, it's already been told. He, he's really, he's just telling a new generation in Revelation uh, a He's given a, uh, he's pulling away the veil so that they can see it in their eyes, in their time, in their cult, and how they're perceiving uh, what's going to happen. So that, by the way, that did happen. Everything that happened that was revealed in Revelation, it actually happened during that time. But we, this is where the destruction of the temple came. This is where, anybody ever uh, seen documentaries on Herculaneum, Mount Vesuvius? Uh, where it blew up over there in Italy, oh, yeah. or around that area, but it, it literally decimated this entire town. It caught them uh, in such uh, such. It happened so fast that there are there are people that look like statues. There's they're still like this, and and this this ash hot burning ash hit them with such speed it caught them in midair some of them are their, their bodies are petrified burnt and and you can see them now uh, everything he talked about there it happened but it's also a shadow of what's going to happen because some people say well it happened so it's not going to happen no he tells you because that which has been shall be it's a full uh, thank you sis it's a full circle it's a cycle that he should he reveals all you'll see these things that have happened to the years and so people think well i just want it to happen one time well you may want it to just happen one time but he's telling you <laughs> these things will happen again and each generation they may see it in in, in a greater revelation than the previous generation or, or the future generation but these these things will happen in a way before he comes so there's going to be no doubt Everybody's going to see exactly what. That's why when you're rooted and grounded in His Word, you're going to you're going to see it. It's going to bear witness to you. This is what He's saying. Everybody else is going to be googling, trying to find out what, what's going on, and and Yahweh is going to speak to you and, and bear witness by your Spirit. You're going to say, "This is the time. We've got to get busy. We got to do this. We got to do that. This is what He's had for us to do." And so, like it, like I said, it's not a time of fear. It's a time when you got to say, "We're about to finish this thing up." <laughs> My uh, my uncle, we used to haul them square bales all the time. Brother Doug knows those things. We had to haul, put the hay up, and you know we we'd haul all all day long sometimes, up into the night. And when we always got that last bale in there, my uncle would always say, when we throw it down, he'd say, "Whoo, we should have got that one first. <laughs> but you know, uh, getting to the end, we knew we were about to get done, and you'd get a second wind. <laughs> You know, we knew we would get home. Mom, mom was going to have biscuits and fried taters and beans ready, and boy, we was going to chow down. And so it was. There was an expectation. We we knew it was time to, to get to work, but there's an expectation. You know, it's not always going to be this way. There, there, this is about to come to a close, and and that's why he shows us these things. It's not a time. If you're in Goshen, it's not affecting you. But this is what it means to be. The intercessors. This is what it means to be the witnesses. This is what it means uh, to be a part of his kingdom. You're his havarim, his disciples. You are his ambassadors. You're here for a purpose in this season. You didn't just randomly get brought here. E.T. didn't bring some uh, weird animal and, and turn you into a, a human or something. No, you didn't come from mud. You didn't come from monkeys. You're not a monkey's uncle. You, you were formed in the image of the Most High Elohim. You were created actually in the image of Messiah. Yeah. You, you, you're created in his image. And so uh, wh how, why didn't Yeshua uh, have any children, by the way? Can I ask this? Physically, biologically. Why didn't he have any children? Because Adam, when Adam was created, the only thing that come from him was the bride. 
Yeshua was here, he's the second Adam. When he hung on the cross and they stuck that, that spear in his side, what came out? Blood and water flowed. What happens when a child is born? Does the water have to break? Is there blood and water when a child is born? This was, when he died on the cross, the bride, was. it was a picture of a calling for the bride, for his bride. Everything that had been told was now becoming a reality. Now he's showing everything that he came for. Now here it comes. And, and this is why the earth began to shake. When the Bible says the earth groans, that all creation, there, there was a worship, there was an anticipation, even in, it's hard for us to understand because we think, well, the earth is not alive. No, the earth is alive. I promise you it's moving. I'm not saying it's a person who's going to open up and start talking to you. And what I'm saying is it is part of his creation. You and I, guess where we came from? The earth. Yes. <laughs> guess where this physical body is going to go if, if, if he tarries after our time, it's going to go back to the earth, <laughs> the physical body, but our spirit, we are connected to him. And this is what I know because of what he's shown me when the scripture says to, to once to die and then the judgment, when you take your last breath, you join him because your spirit is eternal. Your spirit is not flesh. Your flesh has is limited to time. Your spirit is not. That's why he can, Put you, your body to sleep, and he can show you things in dreams and visions, and he'll show you deep things, and you're like getting it, getting it, getting it, and you wake up, and your mind's like, hold on, let's set this thing in order. And you're like, shut up. All right. And your mind's like, okay, maybe it was this. Maybe it was this. He's like, ah. And so he, he, he has to show visions and dreams, and what that really is is he's revealing it directly to your spirit. Your spirit, that which is spirit is spirit, that which is flesh is flesh. And the spirit and the flesh are enmity against one another. For you cannot worship him in the flesh. Those that worship, worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what he shows you in your spirit, you comprehend. And, and you can get it. But when you try to bring it out, you'll mess it up. How many knows what I'm talking about? He shows you things. And you're like, I get it, Lord. Okay, this is what he showed. Well, it was. Uh, ah. <laughs> Oh, never mind. <laughs> He's just good. <laughs> and so th this is what he does uh, in his revelation of who he is. He says, let's go to quickly to verse 21. It says, Pharaoh summoned Moshe and Aaron uh, and said to them, go and sacrifice to your Elohim here in the land. But Moshe replied, it would be inappropriate for us to do that because the animal we sacrifice to Yahweh Elohim is an abomination to the Egyptians. In other words, these animals represent their gods and they're going to barbecue their god. <laughs> and this is literally what happens at the Passover because that lamb is something, it was another thing they worshipped. If you look at, the fair, even now, you'll look at over there, there's big statues and stuff. You'll see sheep. Uh, you'll see these rams, uh, not the trucks, but uh, it's not a Dodge Ram if you drive a Dodge. But it ha has to do with them, them worshipping these different gods. So he's telling them, you're going to have to take an animal which represents their God, and you're going to have to barbecue it. So what happens when you have a barbecue? Does all your neighbors know you're barbecuing? <laughs> they show up, hey, good neighbor, I've been missing you. <laughs> Can I do something for you? <laughs> but this is where he tells them, uh, he said, the, won't the Egyptians stone us to death before their very eyes if we sacrifice what they consider an abomination? In other words, uh, they're going to see us killing their gods and we're going to get upset. Verse 23, he says, No, we will go three days' journey into the desert and offer to Yahweh, uh, sacrifice to Yahweh our Elohim as he has ordered us to do. Uh, this is where the calendar comes back into play. Uh, Yeshua shows up. Everything that when Yeshua's time comes back, he's Remember, Peter says, these are the last days. He, he's not talking about in general. What he's saying is, when, when Yeshua uh, poured out his spirit at Shavuot, at Pentecost, he's literally saying, these are the last three days. We just began the last two days. That's what Peter is saying. He's saying there's 2,000 years left. That's what he's saying. He said, we're beginning the last days. And these days are created to the third day. The, this why he said, I must be in the tomb how many days? One, two, the third. On the third day, he's going to write, he's going to return. You'll see the same message over and over throughout scripture. So he's telling him, them here, he said, We will go three days' journey. We're going to walk this thing out in three days. 
And then we're going to worship him. Oh, we're going to worship him for a thousand years. <laughs> we'll sit at his feet and he will teach us his ways. He's going to teach us for a thousand years. You're, we're, going to, we're going to be learning from him. Not, not in the way man teaches, but you're going to get it. I promise you, you're going to need that new mind. Because what he's going to reveal is far deeper. And what it has to do is not that all of a sudden we're all becoming Einsteins. What, what he's doing is he's revealing all of his creation so that we can rule and reign with him. So that we can have shalom in our walk with him. This is what he's talking about. And so... He says, Pharaoh said, I will, not, I will let you go so that you can sacrifice to Adonai, your, your God, in the desert. Only you are to go very, not to go very far away, inter, intercede on my behalf. Moshe said, all right, I am going away from you and I will intercede with Yahweh that, so that tomorrow the swarms and insects will leave Pharaoh, his servants, and his people. Just make sure that Pharaoh also stops playing games with the people by preventing them from going and sacrificing to Yahweh. He's like, I'm on to your game, dude. I know how your mind is. You say one thing, but you do another. You say, yeah, but you really mean no. And so he's like, quit playing reindeer games. You know, we're, that's not a good reference. But <laughs> but he... <laughs> But he, he says, Moshe left Pharaoh to intercede with uh, Adonai. Adonai Yahweh did what Moshe had asked. He removed the swarms and insects from Pharaoh, his servants, and his people. Not one remained. But this time, too, Pharaoh made himself stubborn and didn't let the people go. He started playing games again, just like he said he would. So this, this is how you can expect the enemy, enemy to act. If it's from Yahweh, it's his faithful, there's shalom, there's going to be a witness, it's going to bear witness, there's going to be peace and everything. He's going to bring people together. He's not going to separate. If it's from the devil, from enemy, he's going to separate people. He's going to cause anguish. He's going to cause all, you know, all these different things to disperse. It has to do with, he said, uh, what's one of the things that he hates? Those that sow discord among the brethren. So this, this is what it means uh, to be Egyptian, uh, to be a, a, a Mitzrayim. That's why you'll see, uh, even in uh, the book of Revelation, it talks about spiritual Babylon. Does he mention spiritual Babylon? Uh, th this is Rome. Th this is the connection to Rome. Uh, Rome, when you understand who Rome is, uh, you got up here, you got Babylon. Down here, you got Egypt. And you know what Rome did? They took from both of them. They've got things from both groups. That's Rome. That's them coming together. Rome blends everything. Rome take. Matter of fact, if you want to know when a pagan uh, worship place or time took place, go look it up in the Catholic Church. Everything the Catholics will always take a pagan holiday and put God's name on it. And that's where that's where you've seen a picture of the false messiah. People say, "Oh, you're hating on Catholics." I, uh, I'm not hating against people. I'm, I'm, I hate the system. I don't have to. You don't have to accept the system just because somebody gets angry. You, Yahweh, I promise you, when he comes back, he's not going to say, oh, you, you know, you, you guys, you're just so crazy. No, he's coming back and he's, he's rendering judgment because people make up their mind. It's about choice. You, we have freedom of choice. We can either choose God. He said, I set before you life and death. Choose life. He said, tell my people to come out of Babylon lest they be judged along with her. That means if you just let them slide, if you don't say anything, you're, that means you're in agreement with it. That's what that means. That, that's why the, the prophets didn't have any friends. Nobody liked them. Even the kings didn't like them. Now, I'm not saying, well, you're going to be hated. Well, you're loved by someone who's greater than anyone in this world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You say, what about my family? Well, if you'll love Yahweh Elohim and obey Him, He'll break the strongholds off your family. You, you can't ease it to go along with your family and expect Yahweh to work when you honor them above your, your Elohim, your Heavenly Father. It doesn't work that way. Once you make a stand, Yeshua had to make a stand. 
That's what the cross represents. He came to show us you, when you make a stand, then everything is under your feet. If you don't make a stand and you compromise, you're counted along with them. And you can't, Satan cannot cast out Satan. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. No woman will see the Lord. No woman will see it. No one will look upon him. And in that understanding that he's in covenant with them. He said he does not, he does not dwell in an unclean house. So here's the difference between Pharaoh and, and you can read on, I'm not going to go on. I want to uh, quickly go down to verse, chapter 9, verse 30. As we finish up, chapter 9, verse 30. It says, but you and your servants, he's talking about the, the thunder and the hail. He says, but you and your servants, I know you still won't fear Yahweh Elohim. The flax and the barley were ruined because the barley was ripe and the flax was in bud. What time of year is this, by the way? Anybody know? Springtime, barley harvest. This is Pesach. This is the time of Pesach. He says the, the flax, uh, in verse 32, but, but the wheat and the buckwheat were not ruined because they came up later. When's the wheat harvest? Shavuot. Pentecost. That's the wheat harvest. That's the counting of the omer from unleavened bread, which is the second day, the day right after the Passover meal begins the unle feast of unleavened bread. It lasts for seven days. But from that time, that's the count every Shabbat. That, that's the counting of the omer. That's what the Brit Hadashah is actually saying. In English, we get they met on the first day of the week. That's not what it says. It, what the original text says is they met on the first Shabbat. Because in, their, in the calendar of Yahweh, there's never anything about the, front, the first day of the week that is Pope, that is nothing but Catholic doctrine. That's all that is. That's the mixing that King James did. Sorry. No, I'm not sorry. <laughs> That's the truth. That should help you. Hopefully that helps you. And if you don't believe me, please look it up. Look it up for yourself. Don't just, what was that one guy used to say about the books? Don't take my word for it. Read it for yourself. <laughs> but this is what he says. Everything that he does, he does according to his Shabbats and his feast days. So that's what Yeshua operated in. That's what the disciples operated in. Since Moshe, verse 33, went out of the city, away from Pharaoh, and spread his hands to Yahweh, the thunder and the hail ended, and the rain stopped pouring down upon the earth. When Pharaoh saw the rain, hail, and thunder had ended, uh, he sinned still more by making himself hard-hearted, he and his servants. Pharaoh, Pharaoh was made hard-hearted and stubborn, and he didn't let the people of Israel go, just as Yahweh had said he would. So, he told them this would happen. He told them uh, everything Pharaoh does is, has to do. Mitzrayim, Pharaoh is, is another word for king. We would say king, a leader, president, whatever you want to call him. He's, he's the leader of the people. It's who he represents. And one thing you have to remember during that time, uh, these Pharaohs, this is very demonic. In other words, there's spiritual strongholds. You, people ever wonder, how do these guys hold power like they do? Because it's openly demonic. They're openly worshiping these false gods, which are nothing but demons. Yeah. And this is what these festivals are all about. The, the, the festivals that they worship, not the festivals of Yahweh, but the, these pagan holidays. It has to do with opening a door and an invitation to these demonic spirits to rule and reign. You're seeing it happen to you this today. Like I said, this, this thing that's coming, it started a couple of weeks ago. Get ready. These things are going to escalate. You're going you're to see these things push, and you're going to see people deceived beyond measure. And people will say, well, how can this AI be so smart? How can a Ouija board talk to you? <laughs> you have to remember that. How can these idols, how come these, how can Dagon be speaking to these people? It's not Dagon. It's not a statue. It's a demon. Yeah. They lie. There's, there's, this is Satan. This is Hastan. It's deception. And that's why I said don't bow down to him. Uh, in, in malls, and you can look this up, in malls all around the country and the world, you know that what they do now is they sit up in, right after Thanksgiving, they set up this big tree and they put a face on it. 
And, and you look it up. I'm telling you, this is, they've been doing this for a while, and it's getting bigger and bigger. Then they have kids. The kids have to come over there, and they start talking to the tree. They have to tell the tree to come alive. They start telling the tree, we want you to, we love you, tree. We want you to come alive. And they'll have this, it's called the clown tree. And it, it just the face, it's huge. If it's a big tree, they'll have this big face on it. And it's sitting there with its eyes closed. These kids are out there hauling tree. We, want, we love you. We want you to come alive. And pretty soon that uh, the tree's eyes will open up. And then this mouth starts talking to them and stuff. So it's prepping a new generation. And they're taking these things that people say, oh, it's just innocent. It doesn't mean anything. No, they're prepping a generation to enter into demon worship. This is how Egypt and Babylon got their authority. You're, you ever wonder how they kept their authority? You ever wonder how the Third Reich was able to do what they do? It's because of demonic authority. This is why people who get into office and nobody voted for them, yeah. <laughs> That's right. You're not going to fight this by your hand. You're not going to fight this by flesh and blood. You, we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and, and high places. You're fighting against demonic spirits who look, are looking to rule and control people. They want to manifest in people. That's why you're seeing all of a sudden, remember the whole thing that was on the news? They found all these people that were on that island and all these Politicians were connected to him, and Trump was there. All the all these government officials were there, and they had these children as slaves, and they're doing all this weird stuff. And then all of a sudden, it just goes off. They start threatening to name names. All of a sudden, you don't hear about it anymore. All of a sudden, the border comes open, and that's the focus. Oh, we got to this, this is the news. Like, wait a minute, what happened to all this? It's because these gods demand the children. They demand, they demand the flesh. That's what's going on. It's open, I'm telling you, and you're going to see it escalate. You, all you do is turn on Netflix. You don't, some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Ain't nothing but demonic stuff that's on there. If it's not demonic, it's perverse. <laughs> you have to be gay or into witchcraft. But anyway, it's kind of like Disney. But uh, let's go on down to Ezekiel, and I'm going to close with this. Ezekiel 28 and 25. Ezekiel 28 and 25, Yahweh Elohim says, Once I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered, once I have shown my holiness in them as the Goyim watch, then they will live in their own land, which I have, uh, gave, which I gave to my servant Yechov, Jacob, I'm talking about the nation of Israel, his children. They will have security when they live there, building houses and planting vineyards. Yes, they will live in safety once I have executed judgments against all the con contemptuous neighbors. Then they will know that I am Yahweh their Elohim. Uh, on the twelfth day of the tenth month of the twelfth year, the word of Yahweh came to me. Human being, turn your face against Pharaoh, the king the, the king of Egypt. Prophesy against him, against all Egypt. Speak out and say that Yahweh, what Elohim says. If you want to know how all these things began, what we call it, we were always told the tribulation. If you want to know how they began, it's because a prophet of Yahweh Elohim will get up and declare it. That's how it's going to begin. It's not going to come through a televangelist. <laughs> It's going to come through somebody that has given their life to Yahweh Elohim and they live to speak for him. They live for his presence and they'll be the one that he chooses to get up and declare that he only needs one person, whether it be a man or a woman, it's up to him. But this is what you're going to see. He says, this is what you tell them. I'm against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Because he's telling Ezekiel to say this. He, he's, got a, he's got a voice. It's called you. You're his voice. You're, you're, you're his shofar. You're a, you're a walking scroll. You're a, you're, you're a living epistle. You're a living scroll. That's what that means. You're a living book of the covenant. He says, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, you big crocodile, Tanim, lying in the streams of the Nile. You say my Nile is mine. I made it for myself, but I will put hooks in your jaws and make your Nile fish stick to your scales. Yes, yeah, I will bring you up from the Nile with all your Nile fish sticking to your scales, I'm talking about dried out, and leave you in the desert. You and all your Nile fish. What are the fish represent? You should have told the disciples, I'll make you fishers of men. Uh, in the net, when you talk, you read about the disciples pulling in the net, that, that whole, by the way, that new, the numerology of that 
the number of the fish that's brought in, if you look it up, is Pesach. It's the same number as Pesach. That's one of them. It's not all of them. It says, you will fall in the open field and be gathered or buried, but I will give you as food to the wild animals and birds. Then all who live in Egypt uh, will know that I am Adonai, I am Yahweh, because they have been a support made of straw for the house of Israel. When they gra- grasped you in hand, you splintered and threw all their shoulders out of joint. When they leaned on you, you broke and made them all wrench their backs. So uh, it's a picture of, a uh, man trying to go to someone else other than Yahweh Elohim for their help. Uh, people do this. Usually that's what Yeshua talks about, money. Uh, this is um, uh, Amun worship. This is a part of the lifestyle of Amun worship. Translated in English as mammon. You can't serve mammon, God and mammon, Elohim and mammon. Mammon had to do with material things. You keep it with you and you take it to the afterlife. That's why he gives... The whole parable of the the man who dies, the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom. The rich man is tormented in the fire. That's all moon worship because they take their servants with them. And he says, go tell Lazarus to go get me some water and bring it to me. In other words, in his mind, even in the flames, he thinks he's he's still going to live that lifestyle to where this guy is still his servant. And he gets uh, an attitude adjustment because he, when you understand what Yeshua, by the way, Yeshua is the one who's telling this. And where does Yeshua get this word from? Did he just make it up himself? No, he said, everything I say, my father tells me to say, this is what the father is going to do. This is what will happen. It's very simple choice. It has to do with choosing uh, who you serve. And so he's telling them, Israel, uh, those that choose Egypt, begin Egypt, to me, is a misnomer because in English it just means a country. But in Hebrew, Mitzrayim means the place of their rebellion. It means to return back to a rebellious lifestyle. But what, what was rebellious before, they're saying now it's not. Well, if it was rebellious and had deliverance had to take place then, it's still rebellion. And so it, it had to do with the witness, to be a stumbling block. And so when they did this, not only were they doing this, but now they're, everybody around them seeing them, what they're doing. So they're like, wait, this is your God? But didn't he deliver you from that? What are you doing going back there? Were you going back and worshiping the same thing? If you look up historically, when, uh, I know we've talked about this before, when it, there was a time, I want to say in the late 1600s, uh, there was a guy who went and he, he, he was taking over Europe, basically, and he goes down and he decimates all the Catholic churches and popes. He actually goes down and into Rome and gets the pope and puts him in prison. So he, in other words, he shuts down the Catholic church. That's what he does. His name is Napoleon. This is what he did. And, and what happened was it looked like the, the beast was dead. It looks like its head was cut off. But then what you'll find is later on it comes back to life. It comes back and starts operating again. This is the beast that Scripture talks about. You have to study history a little bit to understand. Because, you know, we jump from, we're reading the time of Yeshua, and we jump past all, everything in between into our time. We forget there's all, there was a lot of time in between there where these things (laughs) came into a reality. And so these things took place. This is the beast that was, and it it not is not yet, but will be. He said, "There's. I'm showing you what what it was, what what it's, it's turning into now, and what it's going to finish like. This is what he's he's telling him. And so this system. One thing you'll find. Uh, what did Adolf Hitler bring into? You know, everybody seen those videos where he's standing out. I better not raise my hand, but he's he's standing high. Everybody. <laughs> Uh, it's not the Queen wave. <laughs> All our sisters do that when they you see him on the road, but." What he when he's standing up there, you seen everybody going in front of him. You know, you know what he's doing there. You, you know where he's standing. What he literally did is he had the the uh, big area of Pergamon, which was the worship. When Yeshua talks about the seat of Satan, that was that Pergamon. Hitler brings that stone by stone and sets it up in Germany, 
And that's where, this is where he's all of a sudden, who is this guy? He's ruling, he's almost, he's about to rule the world. This guy, and he's, what's the first thing he does? He goes and he kill. he starts trying to annihilate the Jewish people. This man is sick, perverse. And he's, and one guy said, you know, he's sick and perverse. And he, he, may, he said he may have come, and this is a joke, by the way, that at the end he may have come to his senses because he has a girlfriend. And then, then he goes and marries her. And the same day he marries her, he goes and kills himself. <laughs> it's like he should he should have chosen a little bit better. It's better. How bad was this woman? <laughs> he, he married her for, for one day and he killed himself. <laughs> But, you know, and then, no, that's not really funny, I guess. But whenever you look at what he's doing, he's going and he's drawing from this, this, demon, this demonic presence. Uh, whenever uh, Napoleon was doing, ravaging Europe, one thing he did, he sent people down into Egypt to look for the Book of the Dead. He's looking, he's, he wants them to, because he knows enough historically that these things were real this, this whole, even in the Bible talks about all of these things that they did. And there are some other writings, by the way, that's non-biblical that talks about these things. So he had a whole these things and he sent people, emissaries to Egypt to try to get that. Because he, he wants this power, but he doesn't want it from Yahweh Elohim. He's looking for demonic power. That's what's going on today. That's, that's why uh, Ronald Reagan, his wife, always had an astrologer. She dictate their calendar according to what the astrologer gave them for that day. Wow. And so uh, you'll see this even in uh, Obama. What did he do? He set up a prayer room to for it for a, a, a Muslim prayer room in the White House. Uh, what, people say, "Well, I can't believe they did it in the White House." Well, first of all, you shouldn't be surprised because the White House it, itself is a temple, and it's not a godly temple. It's designed after these pagan uh, buildings. It's all Rome. It's all uh, Greek. It's all Greek buildings and Roman buildings. Uh, whenever you understand who Semiramis is, the legend says that she came, she, she, she dies, she goes back to the sun, which is her husband, and she comes back. But you know what she came back in? A giant egg. What's the most important room at the White House? <laughs> what where they get their power? And you look up at the history, and again, I'm not hating on people, I'm just saying this is reality. Uh, the, you look at what the government has, those people in charge. Have you ever noticed that the people in charge never fought the wars? They send the poor people out. They go and draft people who are poor and have them send them to the front lines so that they can keep their money, so they can keep their position. It's called democracy, by the way. That's why that is pushed so much today because this United States, first of all, I don't know why I'm getting into all this, it is not a democracy. They try to tell you, there's groups that tell you it is. You got to preserve democracy. No, you don't. It's a republic. The republic has to do with, you have a constitution that guarantees your rights. That's what a, a republic is. And it guarantees your rights. What, what's the pledge leading to the flag? Unto the republic for which it stands. Everybody knows it. And so that guarantees your rights. But you know what a democracy is? Democracy means that the majority rules. It don't matter what your rights are. They can come together and declare that Satan is now king. And because democracy, in democracy, the majority rules, they could burn the Constitution. They could care less about that. Those that are in charge are going to stay in charge. That's what that means. There's never been a democracy that has survived. It will always end in tyranny. It will always end in war. Because the people, that's what happened to, to Rome, that they said as soon as the people figure out that they can uh, buy people enough to keep them in there, they'll bring these people down, keep them poor, and they'll continue to be wealthy, and they'll stay rich, and they'll stay in control, and, and they'll do whatever they want. They'll say whatever they want to be in charge. You better understand something. These days that we're in, you're going to have to be relying on your covenant relationship with your Heavenly Father. If you're relying on men, you will be cursed. Sorry. That's what the word. You cannot serve God and mammon. What's the big deal in the government? We want cheaper gas prices. And there's always this deal about money. Oh, we, everything is so high. It's like, well, in the garden, there's no prices. 
<laughs> in the kingdom, there is no prices. So that's the distraction. It, well, we're here forever. No, you're not. You're not here forever. Did he supply all their needs according to his riches and glory? It's because we don't want to depend on him. We want to depend on what we can see and what we, we were taught. He said, you must deny yourselves. When you learn to do this, uh, does this mean we all quit work and just sit down and start praying? Hum, hum, you know, pray, pray for the birds to come and bring us food. <laughs> no. He said, tarry until I come. He said, I'm going to sh take you from glory to glory. I'm going to take you from faith to faith. I'm going to, I'm going to send you to Egypt, and I'm going to raise you up and show you how I can bring you out with a strong hand. I'm going to show you my, my power, my authority through our love with you and I. That's how that works. It, you, there's people who know the scriptures. There's people who know history. There's people who know, been seeing all kinds of things, but they don't know Yahweh Elohim. They're not walking in covenant relationship. If they walk in covenant relationship, this is what you're going to see at the end, you, the difference between Egypt there's, there's a, a press taking place right now. And right now, what you're going to see is you're going to see a division between the sheep and the goats. You're going to see a division between the Egyptians and the Israelis. You're going to see a division between the wheat and the tare. You're going to see all these things. This is why the press comes. Because some, there's going to be a group that says, For God I live, for Elohim I live, and for Elohim I die. And if you think that the worst thing you can do is kill me, then send me on, brother. Because <laughs> I know where I'm going. I know whom, who, who I believe, Paul said. None of these things move me. This is how they, they were doing everything they could to him. But Paul would just get right back up and he'd shake it off. There was a, We read about Samson. What would he do when the Holy Spirit would come upon? He'd shake shake. He said, I begin to shake. The earth begins to shake. He said, will he shake the earth again? Yes, he will. He said, I've shook it once and I'll shake it again. That means there's going to be a time that there's going to be a, a remnant that chose him, regardless of what's going on, regardless of what they have or what they don't have, regardless of what they want is coming right now or not. They're still going to trust Yahweh Elohim. They're going to trust him in everything, in every aspect of their life. And this is what he's coming back for. He's coming back for a bride without spot or without blemish, He's coming back for a bride that has waited on him. He's coming back for a bride that loves her husband, that wants their husband, that their mind is always on their husband. He will keep him or her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. And this is what he's coming back for. You can't trade something in this world to take the place of that relationship with your heavenly father. There's nothing that can take that place. There should be nothing standing in the gap. Because this is why Yeshua gives the warning. Don't, he said, don't look back. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. She looked back. She said, well, maybe it's not really that bad over there. Maybe I can make it through the judgment. Like, no, it's not going to happen. And so you'll, you'll see that people have choices. She was delivered, by the way. He delivered her. She had a time of deliverance. She wanted to go back. Because you have all these doctrines now. People say you can't lose your salvation. I'm like, oh. Yeah. Yeshua says you got to take up your cross daily. Yeah. You know, if you have doubts, go back and read what Yeshua says. You're going to see doctrines everywhere. You're going to see hear all kinds of things. But you go back and you read what Messiah Yeshua says. What Yeshua says is the deepest writings you will ever read, by the way. He's covering everything from the beginning to the end. He's covering every issue, every, every trouble, every trial, he's, every outcome that's taking place. Yeshua Messiah is covering that. that. That's why he gives us his word. That's why he's established his word. And so when his word is in us, then now you're a vessel of honor. You're a chosen vessel unto him. And I can tell you for a fact, he brought you here for this time. I don't care who you are. He, the Messiah, he asked the Father for you to be here right now in this time. He trusted you. He has invested in you. He's invested in this time. And this is why you're here. This is why you're at this point in time and in this place. There's good things that's going to happen. But just trust in him. Let him, let him know you love him.
Just, just tell him how much. Let's give the Lord a hand. Father, I thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy, Abba. We thank you for the prayers that you answer. We thank you for your faithfulness, Father, your patience for all that you do, Abba. Father, we give you all the praise and all the honor in Yeshua's holy name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. So Shabbat Shalom. We'll close there. My wife didn't give me the look. I still went again. <laughs> but I've, I've learned from the best, Pastor West. <laughs> so at this time, does anybody have anything? You think any questions, comments, apples, tomatoes they want to throw? Or please no knives, rocks, acorns. Praise the Lord. So if there's nothing at this time, uh, we're going to change the service. Uh, we're to we're going to take up our offerings, tithes and offerings, and get ready to watch your elbows work. And uh, enjoy the food, the fellowship. So if you have an offering for Passover again, uh, the Zadaka box is for Passover. Uh, or if you just want to mark something uh, for Passover, that's that's fine. It's great. Uh, Brother Menendez will be here, the Jerusalem violinist from Texas, as Pastor said. Uh, he's going to be here with, with his violin. I asked if it's a fiddle one time. He said, no, it's not a fiddle. It's a violin. <laughs> And uh, I, I heard a, a guy explain that one time from Nashville, this little boy, he said the difference between a fiddle and a violin is a, a violin has strings, but a fiddle has strings. So I guess there is a difference. So appreciate everyone and their giving. Appreciate everything that everybody does so we can have a place to come and worship. So the kids can grow so the others can grow. Uh, uh, Brother Andy and Sister Lynn will be here, Passover, Seder, we appreciate them uh, so much. And they're a part of us. They uh, were, uh, I told them one of these days where we may kidnap them, but it'll, it'll be a righteous kidnapping. And we'll, we'll keep them here. But uh, anyway, we appreciate them and all that they do, their ministry. Uh, Brother Doug, his ministry, all that he does, uh, we appreciate him their families. So at this time, if there's nothing else, we're going to invite uh, Rav Itzak Halali. The, he's the true, he's not a violinist, but he is from Jerusalem. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Appreciate your brother Itzak. So he's going to have the blessing in the food maybe? Blessing yeah, food. Oh, hey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Brother Itzak Halali. Shabbat Shalom to you all. This is special Shabbat. Because we're going to eat. <laughs> no, not that. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good day, good Shabbat. Um, something Something happened this week in Israel. I want to tell you just a little bit of it, what's happened. You know, um, Joshua chapter 4, almost the whole chapter, God told Joshua to tell to the Hebrews when they cross the river, the Jordan River, you carry 12, 12 tribes and 12 men to carry heavy, I'm sure it was heavy, you know, stone, and cross the other side of the river, east of uh, Jericho. And they, in the chapter, if you read the chapter, you, you see many, 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 I can tell you everything about, uh, about that. But basic, this, God told the Hebrew to do that because generation to come, they ask, what is stone here? And you tell them this is because they crossed the rivers. They didn't get wet, <laughs> you know. Oh, this is another another miracle. We're talking about the Red Sea, but this is another Jordan. You know, the water still not so many water in Jordan, so it was easier. Of the no. 
But anyway, uh, but what's happened this week, the Palestinian, because they control this area by the Jericho, they took the place called, called Gilgal, and we believe these stone, they were there. And they took, took it and built their houses or whatever they do to destroy almost everything. Israel very, very upset about that. But, you know, what can you do, you know? So thanks God for Benjamin Netanyahu. He said, from now on, you don't touch any, any holy place all over Israel. Because they do it many, many places. Because they destroy the proofs, like the land of Israel belongs to Israel. It belongs to the Palestinian. Uh, yeah. So, it's good news now, because Benjamin Netanyahu said, from now on, I'm going to put in you, I mean, garden, I mean, people to, to uh, safety, uh, soldiers or whatever, to, to protect him, himself from uh, destroy everything. So that's a good news. Okay. Shabbat, the song of Shabbat, Ki Eshmera Shabbat, El Ishmerani, Ki Ot Hil Ol Me'ad, Beno Uveni. If I'll keep the Shabbat, God will keep me because this is the covenant between me and him. Ki eshemera shabbat el ishmereni ot hile olmeat beno beni ot hile olmeat beno beni The Kohanim blessing. Yevarehe Adonai Vishmerecha Yoher Adonai Pana Velecha Vichuneka Yisa Adonai Pana Velecha Veyasem Lecha Shalom. Oseh shalom b'imramav. Uya oseh shalom alenu ve'al kol Yisrael v'imru amen. The one who make peace in heaven, he will make peace on us and everybody will say amen. Oseh shalom b'imramav. Who ya se shalom alenu ve ara kol Yisrael ve imru imru amen. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom, shalom alenu ve al kol Yisrael. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom, shalom alenu. Bless food today. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam HaMotzi Lechem Min HaAres Bless our food, God of Universe. Bless our food today and every day to create the bread from the earth. Avinu Shabbat Shamaim Anachnu Modim Lecha Yom Hazeh we love you, we worship you, we thank you for everything. Thank you to send Yeshua, HaMashiach, your son, to save us, to heal us, to take every our need. Bless our food today and every day, and all the family of God will say, Amen.